Welcome to Becoming Church, the podcast where we discuss how the message and movement of Jesus is not just about becoming Christians, but about becoming the church. I'm your host, Kristen Mockler Young, and I'm so glad you are joining the conversation. Hey friends, thanks for listening to Becoming Church. Today, I've got Cedric Lundy with me, and we're going to talk about how to be a pastor without a church home. Cedric, how are you? I'm doing good. I got my my caramel latte this morning, so you know you caught me right in time. Excellent, man! You're you're primed and ready to go then. <laughs> Word, word. That is awesome. Well, you, I know that you currently work at Urban Promise, if you want to tell us a little bit about that, but then I want to make sure you have an extensive background in ministry. And so just tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah. So currently I work for Urban Promise Charlotte. Our vision at Urban Promise is to reach a child, raise a leader, restore community. We reach children by running an after school and summer program for kids in under resourced neighborhoods in Charlotte. We uh, run the after school programs by raising leaders using uh, high school students from those same neighborhoods to run the after school and summer program. Awesome. So they're not volunteering, it's an actual paid job for them, but it's Excellent. more than that. Um, We also invest in those street leaders by providing them personal, professional leadership development. And last but not least, we help guide them through the whole college application process, because one of the realities of our society is that even in the height of racial segregation, we had mixed income neighborhoods, which meant even your rural and urban poor had um, a social network. Yeah. Whereas now kids who are growing up in either rural poor or urban poor have little to no social equity. So it's not that they're not capable. They just don't have people around them who can just help guide them through everything from filing for financial aid, North Carolina residency, get in-state tuition, uh, college applications, scholarships. We just really... um, invest in them with the hopes that they will go on to either a four-year university or certification in a trade skill where they will be able to then help restore community. That's so great. And I will tell you, I know a little bit about Urban Promise. Um, I know Jimmy McQuilkin and Heather Mm -hmm. um, and what great people they are and their heart really for the city. And I will say that um, I think it was when COVID very first started and all of the schools shut down. And we Mm -hmm. realized that in our city, there were so many kids who relied on the meals that they were getting. And I know that Mosaic, um, we gave to support what you guys were doing. I know my Mm -hmm. family personally also gave to support what Urban Promise was doing because you, you guys really did. You responded and you made camps and were able to feed children and any Um, organization, I guess, that I see effectively like boots on the ground responding in such a way that you guys did. We're going to, we're going to fully support all the time. So thank you for truly like an active work, you know, in our city. Yeah, no, it was really, it was really, I mean, that was just such an interesting time. And we occasionally just talk about, Hey, remember when we used to go up to site and we were the only ones there and we're just putting together you know, lunches, because one of the things we do when the kids get there for um, after school is we provide them snack. Well, for some of our kids, that's their dinner. Right. Um, And so knowing that if we completely shut down until things got better, that some of our kids could potentially um, get to a point of, of, of starving and not getting the meals that they they need. Um, we're just like, well, how difficult is it for us to continue to get the supplies that we need to make these bag lunches, but one for every member of the household, and then they can just come by and pick it up and we can do it in a safe way. So, but yeah, those were, that was, that was wild. It was, (laughs) it was, but you guys were, I mean, responded in such a way. And even like you said, seeing the bigger picture and seeing beyond, not only do we need to continue to feed these kids, but their families, like understanding that kids are part of a family and and the way that the family, you know, responds and works together. And I just, it was beautiful. I don't want to, I want to move on to your story, (laughs) but I don't want to miss if somebody is like, oh man, I didn't know about urban promise. I want to help or be involved. What's the best way for them to do that? 
Yeah, so I would say the best thing for them to do is one, go to the website. You can watch all different kinds of videos that tell you about everything from what camp is like to what we provide for campers and families to the street leader program itself. But then another way that you can also get involved is reach out and say, hey, I'd like to do a coffee at camp where you really get an opportunity to come to one of the camps during program and see what it is that we do. Because having come from primarily affluent uh, white evangelical churches when a lot of people I was connected with learned that I was working full time at Urban Promise, they were very quick to say, hey, how can I get involved? And one of the things that was like just kind of almost uh, a reprogramming for them is we're actually, the model we have set up has very few volunteer opportunities for people who aren't the teenagers that we are using to actually do the work. We are empowering them to do it instead of bringing the people from the outside. So a lot of the things that people can do is financial support. There's opportunities to be promise coaches, but I'd say more than anything, like come see it for yourself, come to coffee for camp. uh, I mean, coffee at camp and check it out. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we'll link all of that up in the show notes, friends. So if you're listening and you're interested, just scroll on down wherever, whatever platform you're listening on and you'll be able to click it. All right. So Cedric, when we were talking, you and I were talking on the phone the other week Mm -hmm. and you were just kind of sharing more of your story. We have a lot of intermingling. We have a lot of people that we know, including (laughs) my husband and my in-laws and Mm -hmm. (laughs) lots of intertwined stories. But we kind of realized that you were a pastor without a church home for years. So Mm -hmm. tell us, how does that even work? Yeah, yeah. So rewind it back a little bit. I had been at, um, I I jokingly say the artist formerly known as Church of Charlotte, but it's New City Church. I was there for (laughs) 10 years as the the, uh, middle school student ministries pastor. Okay. Um, And I reached a point where, my burden within ministry had expanded beyond just youth. It wasn't that I had lost my passion for youth ministry, but one of the things that my youth ministry professor specifically trained us on is that you're not just a pastor to youth. You are a pastor to the youth and their families. Mm -hmm. And so really taking that to heart and having gone into youth ministry, having had a youth pastor that did youth ministry for 39 years, I had gone into doing student ministry very resolved to do it indefinitely as opposed to use it as a launching pad into other areas of pastoral ministry. Yes, which happens probably more than just the typical listener would, would know. Yeah. So when yeah. I was in college and our professor was giving us the statistics, he said the average youth pastor spends eight years in youth ministry, but they only average about 18 months at a church. Oh, wow. And right. for the kids who really need consistency and somebody to pour into them, I'm thinking that's not ideal. <laughs> no, no. And I, I had three youth pastors when I was in high school. Um, and you know, even then had a, a, an understanding because of the denomination that I grew up in that some of that was by virtue, was outside of their control. Uh, growing up in the Free Methodist Church, if the senior pastor changed, then he could basically replace all sure. of his staff if they weren't um, licensed within or ordained within the Free Methodist Church. So two of those guys weren't ordained within the Free Methodist Church. So it was like, do I stay here and take my chances or do I go elsewhere? Thus, yeah. I had three youth pastors. So, I mean, that made an impression on me. All that to say, when it was time for me to figure out what's next, um, I really had a hard time figuring out what it was that I wanted to do. but it, I knew it wasn't specifically student ministry. And in hindsight, um, what was really happening was not only a burden to minister to anyone of any age. I mean, I had also started being the campus pastor of our Saturday night service as well. But um, so, you know, Trayvon Martin happens in 2012. Yeah. And as soon as I get back from my sabbatical in 2014, I'll never forget being on the pastor's retreat, the staff retreat, and seeing the images of Ferguson for the first time. Mm -hmm. And that's before it really, really got going. And, you know, between 
you know, uh, um, Mike Brown in Ferguson, you had John Crawford III in Ohio, you had Tamir Rice, you just had all these um, unarmed black men being killed by law enforcement. And um, I started to really be stirred about justice matters, in particular when it comes to racial injustice, and uh, started doing a lot of learning about that. In hindsight, in a lot of ways, um, I started to realize that um, I needed to be in a place where I could really speak to those issues and help people see that talking about racism and dismantling white supremacy was not an aside from the gospel, that justice yeah. issues, which grew beyond just racial injustice, um, are not just an aside to the gospel, but that the gospel is Jesus announcing the coming kingdom here on earth, that things being put to rights here on earth. It's not as we like to joke fire insurance where you just try to escape the fires of hell <laughs> and it's not a rescue mission or right. escapism theology. So um, I just really needed a place where I could do that. So I ended up leaving there and going to Watershed Charlotte becoming the pastor of Justice and Teams, which at that time, uh, long story short, it ended up being more of a volunteer coordinator than it was pastoral. Mm. Um, so that created a tension added with that. Originally, uh, the understanding is I would teach or preach maybe twice a year um, to cover the lead pastors, there's two of them, their vacations. And after the second time I preached, which ironically was on racial injustice and racial reconciliation, okay. they said, we got to get you up here more often because you are very obviously gifted in this area. Awesome. Um, you just haven't had as many reps as, as we have. And they were true to their word. I ended up preaching about nine times in, in 18 months, 18 or 20 months. Great. Um, but uh just the position that I was in was not the best use of my skill set. And we recognized that because it became very clear that my, my wheelhouse is just an old school uh, uh, preaching, teaching, uh, pastoral care, and, mm -hmm. and, and getting into the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the messiness of people's lives in helping facilitate Christ-centered community. And that position that I was in was more of a volunteer coordinator, coordinating the volunteers for the justice initiatives and also uh, coordinating the volunteers because at that time, uh, we're leasing space, setup team, host yeah. team, production team, teardown team. Yeah. And so I ended up um, leaving there after being there for, for 18 months. And um, that led to, in essence, a three, almost three year period uh, where I didn't have a church home. Wow. And that's, that's months unemployed, but. And that's the other part of it for you, right? Yeah. Is because not only did you not have your own church home, but that was also your employment. So then you were also looking for a job. And that was what I really wanted, why I knew I had to have you. I wanted to have this conversation that other people could be part of because even for people listening that are not in ministry or looking mm -hmm. for a career in ministry, I think there are so many people right now who feel church homeless to mm -hmm. an extent. We had a lady come, um, brought her family to Mosaic on Easter. And she essentially said that she was like, I am so tired of being homeless. And she meant a church home. Mm -hmm. And just the weight of that statement, I actually had to clarify because at first I was like, okay, you're homeless. What can we do? <laughs> you know, right, right. help and resource you. And, and she was like, no, 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 no church homeless. But the, but I could just hear the burden on her heart. And so how I know that no church is perfect. Um, yeah. but also you have to find the right place. So that is a long time. Like, is there anything that you can give to the people listening who maybe are still in that, haven't been able to find a place to land? Yeah. Well, and, I, and I'm, I'm glad that you said, you know, no place is perfect because that's kind of the cliche thing that we tend to say. But as I like to say, it's only cliche if it's true. <laughs> yeah. Right. But within that, it's like when you have that friend who 
no, you know, maybe they're, they're, they're sh- the quote struggle. I got my air quotes up yep. uh, with relationships or commitment or something like that. It could be a guy or girl, whatever. Uh, and folks will say, you know, they're just waiting around for the perfect person. Well, is it that they're waiting around for the perfect person or do they just have a couple of real basic things yeah. that they're looking for? Right. 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 So the non-negotiables, the non-negotiables. Yeah. And, and that list doesn't even have to be have to be long of things. Right. And it's not even that we're saying I'm looking for this person to be perfect. But, you know, in general, I want them to be a, a kind caring person. Yeah. I want them to be somebody who actually maybe invests in their mental, uh, emotional health. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would like them to be somebody who's generally good with money. Not that they can't have (laughs) any debt, but if it's the kind of thing where it's crippling debt, eh, right. Yeah. Right. Right. So we're not talking about being gold diggers when it comes to churches, right? We're yeah. just talking about, at the very least, is this going to be a community where there's solid preaching and teaching, mm-hmm. where myself and other people are going to be cared for with compassion from yeah. the pastoral staff? Yeah, or whoever in action more than just in words. Right. Whether yes. it's the pastoral staff or whoever they're spending the most time investing in, are yeah. those people centered around running programs and productions? Or are they centered around um, caring for people? And does this place facilitate Christ-centered community? Mm-hmm. There's all different kind of ways that that last one in particular can be done. I've seen it done a multitude of ways. The issue is for me, and I noticed this while I was unemployed and looking for a job because my degree is in youth ministry and biblical studies. It gave me a very narrow um, areas within which fields where within which I'm going to get hired, right? Because yeah. I put my job resume out there. They're going to see nothing but ministry training and full-time pastoral church service, right? So what's the likelihood that some employer, some random employer, like, I don't know, Red Ventures is going to see my resume and say, oh, he seems like a pretty nice guy, but what's the chances he comes in here and starts trying to proselytize? Oh, I'm sure. (laughs) Right? So... All that to say, as I'm looking at all of these job descriptions and these job postings, and it didn't matter whether it was some large church of 2,000 people or a church of 300, 500 people. Yeah. The overwhelming majority of those jobs, I would say they were not looking for a pastor. They were looking for a pastor CEO. They were not prioritizing someone who would preach, teach, pastoral care and compassion, facilitate Christ in their community. They wanted someone who would grow the ministry, whether it was the entire church or just that area of ministry that they were the steward of. The expectation was to grow that area. Yeah. To be a CEO, to basically manage a space, a place and people yeah. for the for the purpose of growing it. Yeah. And it is such a I think people are seeing more and more how there is a business side to church. There is, you know, you have to have the finances and you have to have the data and the things and whatever. But I totally hear what you're saying. And I definitely think it's a tension that pastors need to manage. Do you have any suggestions on the way that pastors and churches can better do this? Um, you know, it's, in a lot of ways, it's very much a cultural thing. It's been cultivated to the point that either if you want to be in ministry and somehow try to make a difference, you, you got to be willing to, for lack of a better phrase, 
compromise or try to meet it in the middle and you you risk possibly getting burnt mm. or burnt out the other is just to say no i i refuse to do this not to quote sell out cuz that then infers that other guys are are selling out sure. but if that's the way they've been trained to do ministry and that's the only way that it's been modeled for them what are they selling out to they're just yeah. doing they're replicating the example that they've seen mm-hmm. all that to say for me it was very much of like no this is this is who i am i learned very early on in ministry you minister out of who you are and you need to be in a place that allows you to minister out of who you are. That's yeah, not fair that's to good. yourself. And in a lot of ways, it's not fair to that church. Yeah. Well, and I think that with everything shutting down for the last couple of years, so many churches having to reassess and change things, you know, I feel like that was a good start for the ones that were willing to make the change. I know as a staff at Mosaic, we talk all the time about what is a win, right? And it's not always numbers. It's not always like attendance or money or whatever. I think it used to be more of that because that Mm -hmm. was the measurable, right? If these graphs are growing, if people are coming, if we've got more money to do more ministries, I think a lot of churches um, center around those wins. Cause like you said, that was the culture that was created. This is the way we were taught to do church. Right. But I think the churches that are going to be successful now are the ones that go, okay, is a win just more people getting connected to each other is a win having more people, you know, connecting without the staff, like are people gathering outside of our events? Are they truly, like you said, getting together in legit community outside of just Sunday morning. And I think that in order for the church to be successful going forward, we totally have to adjust what our wins are and focus more on, like you said, maybe the pastoring over the CEO yeah. side. Yeah. Because the thing that was really is, it was the most flattering thing for me in all my years of doing ministry and the most heartbreaking mm. that despite the fact that I hadn't been a pastor at at a church and specifically um new now new city and calvary the first church that i was at where i, I mm-hmm. met and worked with your your in-laws yes um that i had people who were actually seeking me out for pastoral care and advice yeah. and wisdom and that was really flattering that these folks, despite the fact that they are plugged in at a particular um, church community, instead of going to the pastors at that church, they were coming to me. Yeah. The flip side and heartbreaking part was because they did not know their pastors. Yeah. Yeah. Or they didn't feel like, or they did know their pastors and didn't feel like that accessibility was there. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So whether it was, um, and, 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 and some of them were folks that I had little to no connection through having been a student ministries pastor, but that was because I tried my darndest to just make myself available and accessible, um, to people, mm-hmm. you know, standing out in the courtyard and shaking hands and giving hugs and kissing babies. I mean, you name <laughs> it, just being out there, being visible, um, making myself at least seem, you know, approachable. And, um, you know, that, that in a lot of ways just really paid dividends as in terms of people feeling like they could, you know, approach me, even though they hadn't yeah. necessarily seen me in a while. And I wasn't like on the staff of the church that they were at, but yeah. I really wish that they had that comfort level with at least one pastor on their staff. Right. And I know that, I mean, not to just like throw platitudes at you. I know that makes God proud. Like, I know that when he Mm -hmm. looks at you, there had to have been moments where he was like, oh, if only we could get you paid and this could, you know, help take care of your bills. But it's exactly, Cedric, what you said. You were pastoring from within and you were pastoring exactly out of the heart that God gave you. And so, yeah. Even though I'm sure it would have been nice at that time to have a paycheck to go along with it, 
that was true. Not that it's not true pastoring when you're getting paid, but that was true pastoring. I mean, that was you fully leaning into who God made you to be and the giftings that he gave you and going, you know what, this is what it's about. And so just good job you. Thank you. And and you even saying that reminds me again, one of the things our youth ministry professor used to say is you, you need to find the thing that you would do without getting paid for it. Yes. And like that needs to be the thing you pursue, because if you do it and do it with excellence without getting paid, someone is going to pay you for it. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been really helpful. Is there anything else that you want to say as yeah. far as church, anything? Yeah. I mean, just in terms of just, so we, we have this time right now where there's this reckoning going on with the church in general Mm -hmm. and one only need to look at the news prior to this most recent tragedy with the school shooting in texas um to just see just one example of that and just the 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 exodus in a way that's happening from um the american church Mm -hmm. and then at the same time it's not that everybody who is leaving is leaving for good. It's that a lot of them find themselves in the position that I was in where it's like, how do I find a church that's a good fit? And the thing for me was, is that by not being in church, I recognize how much of my Christ-centered community was dependent on an institutional church. Mm. So I would say to those who find themselves church homeless or church nomad, what does your Christ-centered community look like right now? This is a great time to assess not just the institutional church, but also yourself. Yeah. Because one of the things that I recognize is that, okay, I've done a good job and I have a, 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 a pretty unfair head start from having been a pastor, but of creating Christ-centered community that I can still lean into without dependence on the institutional church, its schedule, its programs, its calendar. Mm -hmm. But that's not as easy for everyone else who hasn't been a a pastor for well over a decade. So, you know, my wife, she works full time, thank God, because, you know, when I was unemployed for 22 months, if she didn't have the job that she had, we'd probably still be in trouble. Yeah. Um, But because she was, is a full time teacher, she didn't have the time to go to all the things and plug into all the things that other folks who don't work her schedule was able to do. And so um, for her, it was a lot harder not having a church that we could go and be a part of for that period of time. For me personally, I kind of needed a break. (laughs) Yeah, fair. Because a lot of it for me was a job, but um, you know, that's not the case for, for everybody. And so um, who are people that you are creating um, community with that's centered on Christ and that transcends affinity? Because so often the way that we have done church for so long is that we do Christ with people who are the same age life stage as us. We, in essence, like breed people from birth to, in essence, have a perpetual youth group (laughs) where I only do life with people who are the same age and life stage as me. I, do you have community that transcends your age, uh, your your marital status, how many children you have, what age your children are? Um, yeah. So that as well um, is gonna is gonna really help in times where you don't um, have a church to call home. Who are the people that you call home? Because anything in your life can change to where you no longer have that affinity with other folks. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the hardest things sometimes too, about even people who are 
looking for a new church or are between church homes, because I know this, I know people that would go, well, those were my people. Like the people that I called home were the people of that church. And now that I've decided to leave, it's like, I no longer exist to them. Where do people even start with, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's sad, but I think it's common. Oh, it's very, very common. And I would say just that's a really hard one. And I'm going to sound like I'm kind of throwing churches under the bus, but like, just be real mindful of the kind of language that a church uses when they talk about, quote, themselves and talk about what they have going. If they're talking about what they're doing um, in a way that makes it even hints passively, that somehow they're getting it right mm-hmm. and everybody else is getting mm-hmm. it wrong. Mm-hmm. Guess what? You're getting mm-hmm. it right while you're <laughs> there. But once you're gone, you're part of that group that's getting it wrong. Right. So the folks that call that church home, it's not even necessarily um, intentional, but they've been conditioned not to really socialize, hang out and do things with people who don't go there because their whole life is centered around what is happening within that church. So it's not that they don't like you no more. It's just that you're not a, you're not within the orbit of what it is that they're doing. And they don't know how to engage with you. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So not that the lack of intent absolves the impact that it has on the people who it affects, but um, I, 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 I think it's dangerous to also just assume that they are intentionally doing, even though it feels that way. Yeah. And I think we just got to really recognize that this is part of the ways that the way we've typically done church in America, it's, it's kind of created this culture where we're not as mindful of, you know, interacting with people beyond what's set up for us. Yeah. Well, and I would just say too, to the people that are in between, you know, look to Jesus. Like if you're trying to figure out a church and what your church is, look to the life of Jesus. I mean, Hebrews tells us like this, look at him. If you're not sure, put your eyes on him, do what he did, study his story. And so I think that can help people figure out because everybody's non-negotiables will probably be a little bit different depending on what's important to them. But look at the life of Jesus. If, if people groups is important, see who he hung out with. If social justice is important, see what he did. He prayed and he also yeah. moved, you know? And so right. I think and, people can take that time of mm-hmm. being between churches to figure out what did Jesus say about what's important to you and then finding a church that aligns with that. Right. And at the same time, like recognizing that Jesus in the 12 disciples brought together guys who were not all the same. Absolutely. And not all right. And not all perfect and not all the smartest. Yeah. Right. You got, you got a tax collector and a zealot, like the zealot is going to want to (laughs) kill in most circumstances. I mean, literally kill the tax collector because the guy's a traitor, not just to, you know, the Jews in Israel, but to Yahweh. Right. And it would be considered, quote, this almost righteous act. You got fishermen, you got I mean, you just have this this eclectic collection of dudes. But to your point. At the end of the day, their non-negotiable transcended their differences. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Well, Cedric, where can people find you if they want to catch up with you, if they want to reach out to you? Where can they find you? Um, so they can find me at um, on Facebook. Okay. I'm pretty active on Facebook. Buyer, buyer beware. So I, I, I only have kid or tongue in cheek. Uh, it's definitely become a platform where I can speak to a lot of the issues that I'm really passionate about. But sure. I still, you know, share pictures of you know what's going on in the family and my latest uh, culinary endeavors. Um, okay. So it's funny. That because, caramel latte. <laughs> yes. Yes. Cause you know, the caramel syrup, uh, I made from scratch cause you know, okay, that's, bougie. Oh, I, I love it. <laughs> yes, yes. Which is a great segue into also you can follow me if you don't want all the justice stuff. If you just want food and pictures of my dog and my daughter and my family and my friends, <laughs> you can follow me at, 
uh, uh, on Instagram, Big Seti, uh, or just put in hashtag Chef Seti, C E W D Y. So yeah, those and if are they do the, want all the social justice stuff, they should be where Facebook. They should be Facebook. They should be okay. Facebook. And then also, um, I while I was unemployed, uh, had the time to launch a podcast uh about almost yeah just over three years ago so you can also follow me at token confessions awesome is the name of the podcast so we're up to about 90 plus episodes at this point over three awesome. years yeah so it's um the idea of it is a couple of black faces in predominantly white spaces sharing their thoughts and experiences on um race and life in general so it's uh Excellent. with my co-host sanchez fair and uh, yeah, you can you can catch me on that as well. Awesome. Well, Cedric, thank you so much. We will link all of that up in the show notes. Friends, we're so glad that you are here. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any of the upcoming episodes. In the meantime, go find new ways of becoming church and we'll catch you next time. All right. See you.